Shoot, David. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and a warm welcome to Radical Non-Dual, the course podcast. My name is David, and together with Felix and Andy, we started this podcast to present our listeners the uncompromising and pure non-dual teachings of A Course in Miracles. We are based in Germany, so usually this podcast is held in German, and we speak with different and funny German dialects because we come from uh, southern Germany, so we all have these weird dialects that you are uh, spared now that we speak in English. But today is a special recording. We have a special episode um, because we have two very special guests in our show that we're going to be interviewing. These two people um, are wonderful musicians, best-selling authors, and course teachers. And uh, last but not least, they are two wonderful people, and we're very glad and thankful that they are um, giving us the time to spend with us for this podcast. So uh, a very warm welcome in our minds to Cindy and Gary Renard. Hi, you two. It's great to have you on the show. Hey, David. It's great to be Hi, here. Hi, David and everybody. Um, thank you so much for having us. I'm looking forward to this yes. conversation. And uh, hello, Felix. And uh, hello, Andy. Andy and Felix. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great to have you with us. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, as our listeners can hear, we have quite a crowd together for a podcast. <laughs> We're five people, but of course, all our minds are joined already, so you can just imagine us as one. <laughs> and um, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> as we are speaking, it's November the 4th. It's just one day after the election uh, in America. Uh, of course, this is a big thing, even for us as core students. We're still in the world, uh, still normal. So Cindy and Gary, how has uh, the, the night, how has the evening, the election day been for you? How are you guys doing right now? Well, I call it uh, you know, just another uh, forgiveness opportunity. <laughs> uh, we don't know who won still. And uh, we're kind of like following that. And I'm rooting for someone to win. Now, now this is a very difficult uh, area for me because I was kind of like raised on politics. You know, when I was nine years old, Uh, John F. Kennedy was running for president, and he was from my home state of Massachusetts, and he was like my hero. Mm. So uh, I got into politics at a very young age, and of course I was devastated when he was uh, murdered. But, uh, you know, welcome to uh, what my teachers call Psycho Planet. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> like, You know, I got very interested in politics. Now, uh, this is a, a problem for a course student because uh, the course tells us that in order to really learn uh, this course, it, it's necessary for you to question every value that you've ever had. Okay. You know, so now I'm being asked to question every value when I used to, you know, value politics. I used to value the outcome. And uh, what I need to remember at times like this is that the course uh, means what it's saying. Like when it says, there is no world. <laughs> well, uh, it means that, you know, it doesn't say <clears throat> there is no world, yeah, but maybe. You know, it says there is no world. Uh, this is the central lesson the course attempts to teach. So if that's true, and if I believe the course, which I do, then I have to remember that uh, there is no United States, that there is no president. You know, that there is no Congress, uh, there is no Supreme Court. All these things that I used to value are things that literally do not exist. And the idea is to uh, forgive them, not because they're real. I mean, if this one mantra uh, I could give you, it, it would be don't make it real. Mm. You know, because people, uh, they're upset about these things. You know, America has become very uh, polarized And uh, people get very upset about this. But the reason that they're upset is because they're making it real. Uh, how do I know? Because if they weren't making it real, then they wouldn't be upset. <laughs> you know, so I have to remember that. I have to remember to not make it real. So that's uh, been the challenge you know, for uh, last night yeah. and today. And I just have to remember. Now, the second that I remember the truth, I feel fine. It's only when I temporarily forget the truth that I'm not peaceful. Mm -hmm. But if I remember the truth, then I feel fine. So that's really the art of this. You know, like the Course says, what is a, a miracle but this remembering? You know, you remember the truth and then it all uh, comes back to you. Mm -hmm. And that's when you feel peaceful. 
Well said. I, I just want to add something. Uh, my perspective, it's been really interesting because I'm not as political as Gary is. I wasn't raised, you know, really feeling strongly one way or the other in regards to politics or what side to be on. But so I found myself in a position where I'm forgiving the reaction of people to whether Biden has to do with Biden or Trump or the drama surrounding them both, I'm forgiving the reaction of the people, those that are rising up in violence about it. So I find myself not so much attached to Trump or Biden, but, but really watching and observing my own reaction to other people's responses to what's happening. So, you know, my job is to elect the Holy Spirit over the ego. Yeah. That's the election. <laughs> in my, in my <laughs> mind, as I'm, I elect the Holy Spirit, I remember that I can remain above the battleground and see everything with true perception, which is my way of bringing myself back to a place of peace. Remember mm -hmm. that I'm dreaming up the figures in my dream. And whatever's happening in the world in general, and not just the election, but in the world, is actually irrelevant to my peace of mind. It's irrelevant mm, yeah. because it's not the world that is the decision maker or the cause of my peace. It's my decision making mind. So that keeps me above the battleground. You know, yeah. when I just remember that. So that's been my process with this is just mm -hmm. doing my best to be that observer uh, without the judgment. Just watch. Just yeah. look. Just look. Yeah. 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 And by the way, uh, when I said, I remember the truth, uh, since this is a you know, non-dual uh, podcast. Uh, I think, you know, it's easy enough for course students to get the idea that God is. You know? <laughs> I think what's difficult for them to understand is that nothing else is. You know, the, the course is saying, be vigilant only for God and his kingdom. And that's not easy to do when the world uh, gets in your face. So, uh, yeah, you know, we really have to remember that that only God and His His kingdom, which is perfect oneness, you know, the awareness of perfect oneness, uh, that's the only reality. So uh, it's not enough to go around saying that the world is an illusion. The world's an illusion. <laughs> so that's not going to get you anywhere. You have to replace it with something. Yeah. Yeah. You have to replace it with the truth, which is why I think the course does a great job of kind of like refining the idea that this is an illusion to the idea that this is a dream that you will awaken from. And indeed it is that awakening that is reality and it's that awakening that is uh, enlightenment. And of course, uh, it also uses the word salvation, but it's that awakening that is the point. And uh, you can only do that if you remember that you're dreaming. Uh, the Course says no one can uh, wake up from a dream that the world is dreaming for him. You know, you have to shift from that position of being at the effects of the dream, where it's being done to you, to that place where you're at cause and you realize that you're the dreamer and that the dream is coming from you and that you're the one who did it, which is why the secret of salvation is that uh, you're doing this to yourself. And... Uh, I know that you guys uh, know all this, but uh, I think it's helpful to keep putting the ideas together because they all fit together in the course uh, so well, you know, very much like a hologram, all the different ideas and all the different parts uh, fit together uh, into one. And that's really interesting to see. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, you guys, oh, or um, let's hand it over to Andy. He has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Since you mentioned JFK, Gary, um, <clears throat> another important idea is the hierarchy of illusions. And since you mentioned it, and you have a pretty interesting current president to compare it to JFK, <laughs> I, I, I would, I would really wonder what uh, is there anything? Uh, is it just another forgiveness opportunity for you? Have you ever thought about it, or was that just well? It is what it is kind of thing. Uh, I would have to admit that uh, the president that we have uh, today has probably been the biggest uh, political forgiveness opportunity that I've ever had. <laughs> I've never seen anybody like him. Uh, he makes uh, presidents that I used to think were very bad. He actually makes them look good. 
Yeah, like Bush, for example, uh, that was my thing with my American friends. We always were like, yeah, remember the Bush times when we laughed about it, when Letterman had, had his things on, you know, and was choking about the Bushisms. We thought this was bad, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's yeah. an ongoing thing. But then again, if you, if you come from the course per perspective, it's, you know, it gives you, it gives you pause. As well. That's right. Ricky. And, uh, you know, uh, one difference is that George Bush, uh, even though I didn't agree with his uh, politics, He's the kind of guy I could uh, sit down and have a beer with, and I, I think he'd actually be a, a pretty good guy. Uh, Donald Trump, not so. <laughs> I don't think that I could sit down and have a beer with him and have him uh, come off like he's uh, a really nice guy. He's, uh, well, he's, he's my forgiveness opportunity. And Trump doesn't drink, so you couldn't have a beer anyway. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> He's very clear about that. Well, <laughs> so he claims. share a beer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I've seen pictures of him partying. He can have a near beer. <laughs> yeah, right. So you never know. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Well, I could go on and on about him, but so I, I won't. guess. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I then, think then we I cease to speak. Yeah. yeah. I do think the most challenging things for probably all of us to some degree, at least at some point, and for course students in general, is really remembering when Jesus says in the course that there's only one problem and one solution. Like, no matter what, everything falls into that one category of the sense of separation from God is the only lack we need to correct. But we can apply and take those specific things that disturb us and bring that problem to the quote, real problem, and then remember that that problem has been solved because the separation has been solved. That's not an easy thing to do, you know, when that when there's stuff hitting the fan that is not love. <laughs> it's not easy to do that. I'm not saying it's easy, but it can be practiced, you know, when we just remember, come back to that place and remember what the Course is teaching us. And really, it's really an opportunity um, the times we're in now and this whole year has been very challenging for many, you know, and, but to, to bring those, each problem you think you have to that, what the course is saying, the only problem really is, and then practice making that shift, practicing it differently, that the separation has been solved. And um, that can also work with returning your mind to a place of peace, sometimes very quickly, like instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes longer, but I think the key is remembering it, just remembering to catch ourselves when we are, when our peace is disturbed and really, really applying the principles of the course in those moments. Yeah, so uh, we can see that, you know, the ego thinks in terms of uh, separation and the Holy Spirit thinks in terms of oneness. And one of the things that helps me with the course is this uh, completely uncompromising nature. Uh, it doesn't compromise on its ideas. And uh, to help me forgive, not just Donald Trump, but anybody, uh, I have to realize that my forgiveness has to apply to everybody, period, I mean, with no exceptions, or else it's not perfect oneness. I'm not thinking in terms of oneness the way that the Holy Spirit does. And if we want to return to uh, spirit as our reality, then we want to think the way that the Holy Spirit thinks. Uh, you know, Jesus was a pretty interesting guy even 2,000 years ago. Rather than uh, dragging the Holy Spirit or God down to his level, he realized that maybe he better go up to God's level. Maybe he should think uh, the way that God would think if God was here. And, uh, of course, God is not here, which is a good thing, because if he was, he'd be just as crazy as we are. But uh, <laughs> the thing is, uh, we want to think the way that the Holy Spirit thinks. We want to go up to that level. Uh, you know, one of my... Uh, teachers joked with me they said you know jesus is outside the door of the asylum uh calling you to come out and join him and you keep trying to drag him back in and uh no uh, we don't need for him to come back into the asylum we need to wake up and join him yeah i, w I wanted to uh, ask something uh about uh, i have a similar problem often as, as cindy uh described like uh getting upset by other people being upset um, and like their reactions. And, and I think this applies to the, to the vote. It for sure also applies to the whole uh, Corona situation that we had this year. There was also a huge divide in, in Germany for sure. And I guess in the, in the States, 
should you take it more seriously? Should you take it less seriously? And 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 protests and 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 five thousand opinions. And um, I, I just wanted to ask Cindy on on a little bit more. Maybe she has a thought process, some prayers, or something that help you um, stay at peace, observing the world going mad and like i have no investment who wins but i i would have an investment in people not killing themselves uh but that's Absolutely. still <laughs> yeah, still well, still very painful to watch yeah yeah and that's just it i think you you mentioned the word you know observe and that's actually my process i <clears throat> remember to to that my my role again is to observe it um, without the judgment and that's what i remind myself of i remember that if i'm I made this. I always remember I made this. This is my dream. And I, these are, this is actually literally my process I'm describing. I'll say to myself, I made this. This is my dream. I made up the figures in my dream and I make them act out for me by how I am interpreting them. Am I in my right mind when I'm observing them? That's the question I always ask myself. Am I in my right mind? So if I am, then I'll be at peace. But if I'm not, then I'm clearly in my ego. So I, once I ask myself that question, um, and the answer is pretty obvious, because if I'm disturbed, then I'm in my ego. So I remember that I made this, it's my dream. And I switch to being the observer and I practice non-judgment. And I remember that I'm never upset for the reason I think, as the course teaches us. Um, I'm really upset because I've chosen the teacher of the ego. That's why I'm upset. That's painful. So when I recognize that, hey, what I think of as the cause right now, this person outside of me that's reacting in a vicious way, uh, that's not really why. That That's not what's disturbing me. So I have to put it in perspective, in the proper perspective. And then once I do that, my peace turns very quickly. And it's very quick. And it's a quick turnaround, as long as I remember. I just have to do that remember, remembering, which is the miracle, is that remembering to make that shift. So those are some of the ideas that I that I do, that it's my process. It's about remembering the truth. Yeah. Remember, it's my dream. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, Cindy's right when she says the one real problem is uh, separation. So, you know, this whole uh, coronavirus is right up the ego's alley. I mean, these are all kinds of forms of separation showing up all at once. You know, it's the first day of a, a shutdown, and uh, we still haven't reopened everything here in California. It's only like, you know, 25% capacity at restaurants and, and things like that, and people are really hurting financially. So uh, the first thing that the ego does is separate us physically by making us stay at home and, and uh, wear a mask. And then that leads uh, to more separation, of course, because then you have people arguing about whether or not you have to wear a mask. And uh, then you have, you know, that, that leads to, you know, all kinds of divisions. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting to watch the ego at work. And uh, you can always realize that the problem is some kind of separation. It, it takes a thousand different forms, but it's still a uh, separation. And we're having uh, the same problems now that we've had uh, in the past. You know, not only does history repeat itself, but these dream lifetimes that we have repeat themselves. I don't use the word reincarnation because we, we never actually, you know, incarnate into a body. That's a trick of the ego. It looks like you're in a body and it feels like you're in a body, but you never were and you never will be. It's just a sleight of hand uh, based on the idea of separation. You know, so uh, it's all based on separation and none of it's true. And uh, that's where we have to remember not to compromise because uh, there are going to be times when you're going to want to uh, see people as victims and you're going to want to uh, sympathize with them. And all that you're really doing is making them out to be bodies. And what we want to do is the same way that I forgive. You overlook the body. You know, instead of making the body real, you overlook the body, which is also how Jesus uh, healed people uh, 2,000 years ago. You notice that he says uh, in the manual for teachers, at no time does the teacher of God consider the nature of the illness that he is healing. 
In other words, instead of making it real, you overlook the body. And you think of that person as being what they really are and where they really are which is this perfect uh, creation of God, this divine being that is not just part of it, but all of it, which is why I've been uh, emphasizing that the Course is a very big teaching. You know, a lot of its uh, teachers, uh, especially in America, they, they teach it like it's a pretty small teaching. When they talk about love, they're, they're talking about their own personal human uh, special uh, kind of love. And that's not the kind of love that the Course is talking about. The Course is uh, talking about nothing less than the love of God, which is what you really are. So, of course, it says, uh, teach only love, for that is what you are. But it's talking about uh, the big picture. You know, it's talking about the big L, uh, not the little one. Yeah. Yep, we have right. to remember what business we're really in <laughs> that's right and business that, of forgiveness the business of forgiveness and that's the the, the side of duality at least uh, many of us have had some some time to um to to focus on important aspects as well as well during the lockdown and things like that and i know uh, both of you have been writing gary you've been writing on a book and cindy you just published your second book maybe you can uh, give us uh, um, some information um, about uh, your book that uh, the business of forgiveness that has just been published in English and I think it will be translated into German pretty soon. Yeah, I've already been in talks, um, you know, with Michael about the German translation. So it looks nice. like it's coming. Um, so I'm very happy about the timing of this, yeah. um, that this came out when it did, um, because it's been such a challenging year for so many. Um, I think it's good to remember that what everything's for and that everything we do in the world, like our careers and things like that, are, are really, it's really our cover job and our real job for those <laughs> yeah. that recognize that as forgiveness. So that's why I wrote that. That's the real business. And also, I wanted to talk about current events that have been very challenging for many this year, but put it within the context of pure non-dualism. So that's why I bring up things like the coronavirus, my book, Suicide and Depression, which is rampant and all topic. over the world. But I'm, again, putting it within a, a larger context of, of not on how one can shift their perceptions of death itself. Yeah. You know, um, death being a thought in the mind, just like birth is a thought in the mind. Um, but I really expand on the theme, I, under, I really expand on forgiveness throughout the whole book, bringing everything back to forgiveness. But I do um, touch on all these different subjects um, to give people a different perspective. There'll be people that are drawn to the book that aren't course people, and of course those that will. So I had to write it within a context also of those that might be beginners of A Course in Miracles as well. Um, and then bring it, all back full circle, always to reality. What's, what's reality? What, you know, as opposed to the illusion. And so really that's what I wanted to do in this is, is be able to relate to people and address very specific subjects, you know, and, but again, show them in a different light. Yeah. There's another, always another way to perceive. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I was, uh, well, uh, it's a great book, uh, and Cindy worked very hard on it. I know because I saw her, <laughs> and, uh, and when I read it, I, I realized, well, she is really uh, coming to her own as a great writer, so a great course writer. So uh, I was thrilled to see that. Yeah, that's wonderful that we can receive your books and hopefully next year um, you can talk about it personally when you come to Germany, if it works out. So fingers crossed. Um, and Gary, I saw recently a Facebook post where you two were in a national park. You were sitting at the, at the lake posing uh, or just thinking. <laughs> and Cindy took a picture and you said your path, you have been thinking where, where you're now in your life. And I thought it was a, it's a beautiful, it was a beautiful message to the readers that you again, reassured the decision to be truly helpful and to continue the work. So you will also be continuing to, to, to be teaching and writing books, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, my uh, fifth book is about, uh, you know, finishing the job. It's about going all the way home mm -hmm. to God, achieving uh, enlightenment, what it's like, uh, what it feels like, what it looks like, uh, some of the processes that you, you know, go through uh, in your mind. 
And by the way, you don't have to act like you're enlightened. You know, you don't have to look like you're enlightened. Uh, it's all at the level of the mind. You know, so, uh, you know, most people in the world, they'll, they'll look at other people and they'll judge them by what they look like and how they act and, and all that. But this uh, is done completely at the level of the mind. And this is, of course, in mind training. And, uh, you know, when it says things like, you know, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. Well, when you do that, now you're dealing with the cause instead of the effect. And the effect will take care of itself, you know, because uh, the world is just an effect. Uh, the Course says if you change your mind, it will change automatically. Well, I don't think that that necessarily means that it's going to look the way that you want it to. Uh, but your perception will allow you to be peaceful no matter what the world is doing. And if you can get to the point where the world cannot affect you, like it says about forgiveness, of course, it uh, you know, uh, denies the ability of anything not of God to affect you. If you get to the point where the world can't hurt you, then that's real power. You know, uh, it's not the kind of phony power where you're kind of like moving around the uh, deck chairs on the uh, Titanic. You know, it's like uh, you're actually dealing with the cause now, and then you can be happy regardless of what happens uh, in your life, which is a pretty high uh, aspiration, but it is doable. I mean, the Holy Spirit wouldn't give us a job that wasn't doable. So it is possible to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, and by the way, yeah. we're also, probably before Gary's fifth book comes out, we're going to have our relationship book out first. Excellent. I forgot. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. That's that's still in. We're we're still working on it, but it's almost there. Yeah, so, yeah. that's yeah. that's wonderful. We had we had an episode of our podcast about relationships, and of course, we talked about having a relationship with a course student and having a relationship with a uh, a person who's not been reading <laughs> the book. And basically, the summary is: you have to do your forgiveness work no matter what comes up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I mean, be prepared to forgive anything, no matter what comes up. Make it all the same. You know. Yeah. Hey, if our if our peace is disturbed, it's disturbed. Period. There's no. It's just there's no. There's yeah. only one cause for that, really. Do, and, do you do you guys ever uh, if when you're if, if it, in case it happens and you're arguing, do you ever um, then come up with a quote, quote uh, course quotation? Or are you <laughs> are you beyond this level that you're saying, oh, uh, if you're feeling attacked, you're uh, that's because you're making it real? Are you into that kind of, uh, or have you had this experience before? Now, the reason why our relationship works so well is because Gary has accepted the rule for a happy marriage and the rule, <laughs> the two rules. The two rules is Here number comes. one. Number one, the wife is always right. Yeah, right. No, number two, if you don't believe that, slap yourself and read number one again. <laughs> yeah, that's easy like that. <laughs> that's simple. There you go. See, that, that's why we get along so well. Yeah, and uh, we're also fortunate <laughs> in the sense that we don't have very much to forgive with each other. Uh, you know, we, we just don't. Uh, once in a while, we'll have a disagreement, and you know we don't get angry about it. But you know, maybe I'll want to go somewhere and do a workshop, and Cindy doesn't want to go there, and you know, be that that kind of a thing, and which is over like in a minute. <laughs> you know, it's like we know how to forgive, and uh, you know, maybe who knows? Uh, the ego is very clever, so maybe uh, something will happen sometime where we're really going to have to forgive each other. But that doesn't happen very often with us. I think, I think the key is, is when you know how to forgive and, and we do, we know how to forgive. Um, even if you're mildly disturbed, you know, it just doesn't last very long. So it doesn't mean we don't have disagreements. We have disagreements, um, but we don't, it doesn't last. We always come back to the truth and we don't have to say that to each other. We just, it's just a, like a, a deep understanding. We just do it kind of automatically. Um, so we don't have these loud arguments or anything like that where we're shouting at each other or anything like that, but we can tell when we disagree, but it's kind of like we just sort of accept that and then move on that we, it's okay to disagree, you know, and we're not meant to have that, that kind of perfection in our relationships. You can have perfect forgiveness, but we're not expected to be perfect here in regards to behavior. That'd be kind of silly, you know, so that's an important part of that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not saying that uh, yeah. 
if you do the course, you'll never get upset. In fact, I can pretty much guarantee you that you will. But uh, I remember I used to go to a study group when I first started doing the course. In fact, I went to the study group for about 11 years. <laughs> and uh, I realized after a while that the reason that I was there was to forgive the other people who were at the study group. <laughs> So, uh, you know, whether you were in a course relationship with someone or not, there's always going to be something to forgive. There's always going to be something that starts to make you feel a little bit anxious, a little bit worried. And that's the red flag you should be looking out for. As soon as you're not feeling peaceful, well, that means that there's something that needs to be forgiven. And if you can uh, kind of like watch out for that and forgive as quickly as possible then you're going to end up spending almost all of your time at peace. And uh, that's more important than people realize because your mind has to be at peace in order to go home to God or else it just wouldn't fit in. It'd be like you know, trying to fit a square block into a round hole. And it just wouldn't uh, make it. So uh, you literally have to have your mind returned to a condition of peace in order to return home. If I may, I just was reminded of something that I uh, recently read, I think in your third book, Gary, um, about the famous statement, uh, the script is written, but not etched in stone. Yeah. And um, since both Cindy, you mentioned that you're happy that the book came out right now. And, and Gary talked about uh, his new book uh, going all the way. I was wondering if your um, approach to your everyday life has changed since Persar and Arten uh, have revealed quite a bit of your personal po possible scripts, uh, or if it's still the same like it began when you started with the course. Good well, question. I know that, um, well, last night was a good example because uh, at the time it looked like Trump might be winning. And, uh, you know, like even four years ago, I would have been a little upset about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, last night I was pretty calm about the whole thing. I noticed that. So, you know, that's a good, that's a good thing. I mean, the Course says that, you know, a uh, tranquil mind is not a little gift. You know, it's a big gift. And uh, so I think I just forgive uh, faster. I think the more you do this, it becomes kind of like an art where you're used to uh, kind of like catching yourself if you're, you know, starting to judge something or starting to make something real. And uh, the, the quicker you can do it, you know, uh, the better you can do it. And all the ideas about forgiveness, they all start to blend into one, you know, so it becomes like uh, an attitude, you know, just a natural uh, state of mind. It happens uh, automatically. Like it says at the beginning, you know, miracles are habits. Uh, you get into the habit of forgiving uh, so much that you would miss it if you don't do it. And so it's more natural eventually for you to forgive than to judge. At first, it's definitely the other way around. It's way more natural to judge than to forgive. But the time uh, comes somewhere if you practice every day. Uh, the time will come where it actually becomes more uh, natural and automatic for you to forgive rather than to judge. I think, I think, I think my experience with Art and Persa sharing so much <laughs> about our possible illusory future and even this lifetime and then our what appears to be our past we know that's an illusion but uh, we all know what we mean when we say that yeah. i have it's helped inspire me i think um they're, the information they're presenting to us has really inspired me to step up my game to be vigilant only for god that specific practice be vigilant only for god that's what i've noticed the most about about them sharing all that they've shared is that um, it's just inspired me to to grab every opportunity I can to notice those things that do upset me so that way which is more rare these days but it does happen but it's very mild um, but I still can I can still feel some anxiety at times things like that so what I do is I just uh, it really, really, really helps me to grab those opportunities and, and to use them more for forgiveness and do that every day, you know, really have a set, not, I wouldn't say ritual because I don't, it's not, I don't want to make a ritual out of all this, <clears throat> but mm -hmm. I am very aware of when I get up in the morning, um, the first thing that I do is always turn my day over to the Holy Spirit 
always remember that I'm not in charge. Um, always remember that, you know, when I let go of judgment, <clears throat> my peace will return. You know, there's, there's, when you judge, that's, that's the cause of all loss of peace is, yeah. is actually there. There'd be only peace if we didn't judge anything. Peace would just be its natural self. Love would be itself if there was no judgment. So that's been my practice. I've really um, felt I wanted to step up my game with that <laughs> more and more. And it's paying off. It really yeah. is paying yeah. off. I can see the benefits of that. That's, that's a wonderful approach because uh, when I thought about this, I thought, well, this could easily be um, judged as pressure. For, for example, or uh, an excuse to just let it go because, you know, um, we all know we're going to get there by the end. But, you know, that doesn't help on your everyday approach. So it, I was really curious how, how you deal with this because, you know, uh, hardly any one of us has the opportunity to have, well, like you said, huge parts of the possible script laid out in front of you and put in a, in a book, you know. <laughs> so it's like... It's a challenge, probably, uh, at least well, it could be. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I feel like I know more about what's supposed to be my next lifetime than I do this one. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Arden and Person always said, my teachers always said they didn't want to deprive me of my forgiveness opportunities. Mm. So, they don't tell me very much about my personal future. But we do talk about uh, the script and about time in A Course in Miracles, which is very, a very esoteric uh, subject. But when it says the script is written, well, that's true. But it doesn't mean you have to experience the whole thing. Uh, through uh, forgiveness, there are all kinds of things that can happen. They're really done by the Holy Spirit more than you, uh, such as the idea of uh, collapsing time uh, or the idea of uh, having different uh, dimensions of time. These are ideas that are in the Course that the Course doesn't really fully explain, but it does... Uh, you know, and give you a general idea, like that great work with lesson number 169 uh, talks a lot about this and how, uh, you know, we but undertake a journey that is already finished and all that stuff. But then it says, suffice then to say that you have work to do. So uh, the Course is saying, okay, it's already happened, but you still got to do it. And the reason that you got to do it is because uh, you don't have to go through this whole thing. Uh, the miracle uh, can... Uh, substitute for learning that may have taken a thousand years or thousands of years. You know, so uh, there are reasons for you to do it and we can't see everything. You know, the Holy Spirit can see everything, but it can be a little uh, frustrating for us because uh, even though the Holy Spirit can see everything that ever happened uh, from the beginning of time to the end of time. And we know from that uh, workbook lesson that time does have uh, an end which is good, and it's a happy ending. So uh, at least we know that much. Uh, but what we are being promised is that if we do this, then we will save a lot of time. In fact, it says the chief aim of the miracle worker is to save time. So uh, that would be a good enough reason to do it anyway. But then there are all kinds of other uh, fringe benefits that go along with doing it. Not that those are the reason to do it, but they're kind of like uh, an after effect. You know, what the Song of Prayer calls the echoes of God's love, the, the uh, harmonics, the overtones. Uh, these things are secondary, but they are there and they are fun and they do lead to good things. David, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So thanks, thanks, Felix. I, I have a short question about speaking of reincarnation, um, because the course often is very close to Buddhism, and in, in Buddhism there's this concept of the bodhisattva, who is like an, in I guess it's an advanced being that uh, postpones the complete enlightenment to come back to the to, to the earth to be helpful and be supportive of other people, which I find the idea is quite nice, but course the course isn't uh, um, touching upon this and I, I i've heard things that okay if you're enlightened you're out you, you don't kind of come back you don't appear to reincarnate um but i just wanted to ask because i do get this question often in course groups as well about the bodhisattva concept do you think there is something like this that also would um, agree with the course concept or does that not fit together well uh it doesn't agree with the uh, the course concept which is uh you know, I think what the Holy Spirit wants for us is for us to go home. Yeah. And uh, we don't have to keep coming back 
to uh, help everybody else because that's the Holy Spirit's job. Yeah, that's what the Holy Spirit is for. And if everybody uh, kept you know, coming back to help everybody, then nobody would ever leave. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> the Holy Spirit wants us to go home. <laughs> now, uh, the Bodhisattva, I, I'm curious about that because I always wondered, it's possible that that idea in Buddhism, the Bodhisattva, is kind of like uh, Arden and Cursa in the sense mm -hmm. that even though they are no longer visible, as the Course would put it, their image uh, can yet be called upon. And it's possible that the Bodhisattva uh, idea in Buddhism was originally intended to be that, that uh, the image of that person could yet be called upon, but that that person would go home to God. So then you get the best of both, best of both worlds because that person gets to help go home and yet also help you at the same time because their image is being used by the Holy Spirit. So I just try to explain to people that Arden and Persa are actually the Holy Spirit yeah. Uh, showing up as art in person, you know, because they're out of here, you know, they're home with God and they're never uh, coming back. And uh, Jesus is never coming back. I hate to break it to the Christians, but he, he's out of here. He's home, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's like, yeah, people can still see him just like they can uh, still see the Virgin Mary, just like they can still see angels or uh, ascended masters. You know, the Ascended Master, uh, St. Germain, has been appearing uh, in Mount Shasta for decades. But what that really is, is the Holy Spirit showing up as St. Germain, using that image to communicate with people in a way that they can accept and understand. And uh, it took me a long time to realize that about our new person. They had me use a quotation right at the beginning of my first book that explained that, and I had no idea what that meant. Yeah, there are all kinds of things that it took me a long time uh, to understand. And, uh, you know, I don't pretend that I figured the course out or that, uh, you know, I, I, you know, knew what the course meant. In fact, if it wasn't for them and uh, then later uh, Ken, uh, I wouldn't have known what the course meant. I would have made up my own version of the course, which is what most teachers do because they take something that they already believe and then they borrow quotations from the course that look like they support what they're saying, but they're not really teaching the course. And I might, I might have done that if uh, I didn't have some very good help uh, all along the way. Yeah, I, I like that, that, that concept. And it, 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 what you explained about the Bodhisattva, I, I didn't know about the word, but I sure met uh, at least one person who claimed exactly that, that he came back and basically was enlightened and now he's... Uh, here to help me and over the years I got was getting more and more doubts about the validity um, just because he didn't really seem like a genuinely peaceful person um, yeah. so, so and it, it can seem like uh, very I become very important if I need to come back um, in order to teach you it makes everything so real um, so I, I think thanks for that new way to put it yeah uh, that's true you know it's like jesus said to helen in the course but he really meant it uh, for all of us he said you are not special mm -hmm. and i and i figured if anybody's special it would be the scribe of the course of miracles <laughs> and he's even saying to her you know you're not special none of us are and he, he doesn't even claim to be special uh himself you know he says uh we are different only in time but time does not exist and we will be equal as teachers, which I found a pretty far out idea at first that I would be Jesus equal. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, he's saying in the course, he's just uh, an elder brother. You know, he's, he's not God. You know, he says, uh, you know, that uh, reverence is not appropriate and R is not appropriate as a response to him, but it is an appropriate response to God. You know, so uh, I, I try to remember that and then I can say, okay, we're all going to end up at the same place. Just like you said, we're going to uh, all be at home in heaven eventually. Uh, the question is, how long do we want to prolong our suffering? And uh, we can uh, cut out our suffering if we really want to practice. But that takes uh, determination. You know, I think you really have to want the results of the course uh, in order to do it. I think what helps me too with all this is always remembering and bringing it back to 
the world is done and over. For some reason, that line to me brings me back again pretty immediately. If the world is over and we're really accepting that idea, we have to accept it. But once we do, then our only function is who we're watching our movie with, who we're, right? The ego or the Holy Spirit. I mean, it always comes back to that core idea. If the world's over, I'm watching it in my mind. I can switch to the Holy Spirit script, which is the forgiven script. The doesn't mean the events in the world will change. They don't have to, but your mind is changing and your mind is awakening. It's becoming more peaceful. And that's what really matters. And you can shift dimensions of time. It's still within a fixed script, but you can have a different scenario within the fixed script play out. That can happen. Um, but it doesn't matter. That's the point. What happens? It's really how you're looking at what happens. You know, how we're really thinking about it. What is our state of mind? You know, and so that those ideas are also, if anyone wants more practical ideas, kind of kind of start entertaining more of those core, those key principles the Course is telling us, the world is done and over, right? Those, the world, there is no world. So we have to be mentally reviewing it, right? And so it's no different than the dreams in, our, in bed at night. The mind is bringing up those images. The mind is watching, you know, your body's eyes are closed when you dream in bed at night. So you're not seeing anything with the body's eyes. So the mind is hearing, seeing, thinking, you know, so when we remember that too, it, it makes it a little bit easier to move into the shift in perception, the miracle the Course is talking about. Uh, by the way, that idea of uh, putting the Holy Spirit in charge every day is very important. You know, people think of Jesus as being like the ultimate leader, but the truth is uh, he was the ultimate follower because he says in the Course, he says, eventually I just listened to one voice. You know, so he listened to the Holy Spirit, just one voice. And I try to do that. I mean, in my mind, I, I talk to Jesus because I always did ever since I was a kid. But, uh, you know, I've said to him at least three times today, you know, you're in charge. You know, you be in charge. And of course, what he's in charge is uh, our thoughts. Because he says in the Course, what you do is a result of what you think. So the emphasis in the Course is always on the thoughts, always on the mind. And then the rest will follow uh, naturally. And if you're uh, practicing for forgiveness and undoing the ego, then that is going to lead to love uh, automatically. You know, you don't have to try really hard, you know, to be like Jesus or to be loved because that's what you are. All that you have to do is undo the false you, you know, work on undoing the ego. And the more you do that, the real you will be all that's left. So that's the approach of the course. It's, it says it doesn't aim to teach the meaning of love, yeah. but it does aim at removing those blocks, which is the same as undoing the ego, you know, to that awareness of love's presence. And that love's presence, you know, I mentioned earlier that the course is a very big teaching. Well, uh, your natural inheritance is nothing less than the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is here, you know, right now. You know, it hasn't gone anywhere. The truth uh, hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, it's still here right now, and it's being covered over by this thin veil of an illusion that looks real, but it's not. And it reminds me a lot of something that Jesus said 2,000 years ago, which you can see in the Gospel of Thomas. You know, the disciples went up to Jesus, and we said, uh, when will the kingdom come? And he said, well, it will not come by watching for it. It will not be said, behold here or behold there. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth and people do not see it. Well, the reason that people don't see it is because it's out of their awareness. It's not that it's not here. Of course, it's totally abstract. It's non-physical and it doesn't have any edges or borders or limits or anything uh, to it, which is why the Course teaches that complete abstraction is the uh, natural condition of the mind. But it's here and it's possible to experience it, even while you appear to be here. And at first, uh, maybe you'll have very short experiences of your perfect oneness with God, which the Course calls revelation. But as we know, the Course doesn't use words the same way that other people use them. It's not uh, the imparting of uh, intellectual knowledge. Uh, revelation in the Course 
is kind of like the same way that the Gnostics use the word gnosis, which means direct experience of God. Yeah, gnosis means knowledge, and the Course also uses the word knowledge sometimes, but not about the imparting of you know, anything intellectual. Uh, at the end, the Course becomes very experiential. At first, it looks very intellectual, but eventually you realize that that half a million words in the Course are meant to bring us to a place that is beyond all words. You know, so eventually you'll get to places like in the workbook where Jesus says, you know, about all these difficult questions that we have. Uh, he says, there is no answer, only an experience. Seek only this and do not let theology delay you. And what he means is the real answer is that experience of your perfect oneness with God. Because in that experience, there are no questions. You know, the questions only exist in the dream. Uh, outside of the dream, there are no questions. There's only the truth. So uh, the emphasis on the Course is not about uh, questions. It's about awakening. And when you awaken, then the questions disappear. And all that's left is the truth. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, I wanted to... Um ask you maybe um, a question about a topic that seems to generate a lot of misunderstanding and we've basically been talking about it a lot in this conversation already it's it's the the, the question about the you in the course so the you that the course addresses so we start as gary as david cindy and uh, felix and andy reading the course and the course is talking to you that we're identifying with this and that the, then as we read and move along, we kind of realize that the you, the course is addressing is something way beyond this, this body, this identity, this specific person. But still, it seems to generate a lot of misunderstanding and, and a big, you know, it needs a big leap to, 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 to grasp that. How, how, what do you recommend people to approach this topic to get a better understanding of the you that the course actually addresses? Well, I'm going to let uh, Cindy uh, answer this. I just want to give a short answer. Uh, the Course says, who is the you who are living in this world? You know, spirit is immortal, and immortality is a constant state. You know, so that truth I was talking about that's already here, it's a constant. You know, it doesn't shift or change. It's just beyond the veil. And the you that the Course is addressing, and I think uh, Ken Wapin ex explained this pretty clearly, it's, it's kind of like you're the observer or the decision maker or the one that chooses. In fact, that's your only real power in this world, according to the Course. Uh, it says that the power of decision is your one remaining power as a prisoner of this world. You can decide to see it right. Uh, in other words, you can decide to see it with the Holy Spirit instead of the ego. And that's the you that the Course is persuading to one of those choose against itself, because we used to identify with the ego now we're coming to identify with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is slowly but surely uh, taking over your mind in a good way, in a voluntary uh, sort of way, because it really is more fun to be spirit than to be a body. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, you're being slowly but surely persuaded that, uh, you know, what you really are is something that is way beyond the body, and that ultimately you're not a body. So, uh, you know, that you is just the part that chooses, even at the end of the text where it says, choose once again. Uh, it, it's really talking about that choice, which is our only real uh, power that we have in this world. Well, he answered yeah. it very well, but I'll just, just say, the say same a few thing words. Again. Yeah, yeah, just say a few words. Just repeat it, that repeat might, it. Doesn't just matter. might help people just grasp more the idea that, it starts with the idea of remembering we are mind, not body. So that takes some experience and practice to, to believe that, to get to the place where you're really disidentifying with the body as your reality and remembering you're always mind. So yes, the you the Course is addressing is the decision-making mind. And that decision-maker chooses and there's only one, by the way. There's not seven billion different minds, although it looks like it. It's very deceiving. And that's the biggest trick of the ego. The biggest illusion is that we're separate from each other and separate from God. There's only one. So the one decision-making mind has a choice, at least how the Course explains it. And you're, you're, you, you can choose the ego or the Holy Spirit. 
Um, but the key is remembering you can practice the idea um, that you're not a body by reinforcing certain ideas in the course. You might want to repeat them often to yourself. The course, the workbook has us do this too. Certain phrases or things that need repetition. Things like, I am as God created me. His son can suffer nothing. I am his son. You know, I am exactly as God created me. You know, though, or I am not a body. I am free. I'm still as God created me. I say, I repeat those things all the time. It reinforces the right part of your mind when you do that. So that gradually over time, you're, you're disidentifying with the body as you. The body has nothing to do with you. So as you look in the mirror and see that image, that's a projection, you know, coming from, from the mind. And you can remember just as you know that image in the mirror, you're not really in the mirror. The mind is projecting that image onto the mirror. So just practicing some of those ideas and reinforcing that. And you know what, what helps us to, to come back to that idea that we're mind is forgiveness really, because that's what undoes the false sense of self, thinking we're bodies, making the body real and the world real. And the world is a body, it's a, the form of a body. So when we forgive, as the Course is teaching us, true forgiveness, uh, we are, right, we are disidentifying more and more with the false sense of reality, the false sense of self when we do that. So my recommendation would be to keep forgiving, keep practicing forgiveness of anything that disturbs your peace on any given day and you're undoing the ego. And when you undo the ego, you're just gonna have the experience of what the Course is saying is true. It will eventually come where you're like revelation or just you'll have more and more of that reinforcement of, through your experience and your experience will tell you that this is true. You know, but we need, we need to undo the ego and the guilt the unconscious guilt through forgiveness. That's what does it. So. Never forget to laugh, sort of. Right? And never forget to laugh. Very important. That's the key. That, yeah. never that forget. reminds me of something. Uh, since we're approaching the finish line almost, Gary, any any good jokes for our German listeners, maybe? Because you're famous for your jokes. That That's what I what I understand. Oh. So any, any 2020 is a joke. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, gee, it, it, it's hard to choose because, first of all, you never know uh, if the joke is going to go over in another language. Right? Some, I've had sometimes when the translator will translate it well, but uh, they, nobody gets it because it just doesn't work <laughs> in that language. David does a good job. David, yeah, David does. <laughs> so he's on the team, so you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll try to choose one that isn't too long. Uh, okay. Uh, these four ladies are in a retirement community in uh, Arizona. They're retired, they're uh, playing cards, they're not doing anything special. And a new guy walks in. He's kind of like a handsome guy. And so these ladies, you know, they're interested in him. So the first lady says to him, says, hey, uh, you're new here. Obviously, uh, you're retired. What did you do for a living? And he says, well, ladies, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to tell you the truth. Uh, I actually spent the last 25 years in prison. A little take it back, you know, and the, the second lady says to him, oh, what were you in prison for? He says, ah, uh, murder. The third lady says, well, who did you kill? He says, you know, ladies, I'm going to tell you the truth. You know, I'm just going to be honest with you. I killed my wife. And the fourth woman says to him, she says, so... You're single. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I think that translates really well. So, yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> we don't have to do much work there. <laughs> when I come back uh, to Germany, I'll tell. I'll begin with my famous bear joke, which I can't oh, tell I love you. I that one too. Uh, that's, we were in uh, Yellowstone National Park uh, this summer. <laughs> And by the way, that's been one good thing about this uh, whole virus thing. Uh, we got back uh, to nature. You know, we, we went to Yellowstone, we went to Grand Teton, we've been going to uh, the ocean, we've been going to parks. It's been, uh, it's been an interesting uh, experience. And uh, I don't want to call it a silver lining because there are a lot of people here who are hurting. You know, a lot of people are in uh, very bad shape financially, 
and uh, Cindy knows about you know the, the suicide and the depression that's going on. And I I don't want to feel guilty about the fact that I haven't really had that bad a year. <laughs> you know, I mean uh, I've I've only done two workshops in person this year. One was in February, just before this whole thing hit the fan. And uh, then I just did a workshop in Mexico. Mexico. What was a conference with uh, three other teachers. And, and it was a very good experience and just having to be out of the way. And, uh, you know, people practice social distancing the best that they could or mask and things like that. But usually I'll go out and do about 20 uh, workshops in a year. And this year I've only done two. And uh, things aren't, you know, looking that much better yet mm. when it comes to the virus. But uh, the thing is, all these things that happen, uh, if you don't know how to forgive, they can kind of like, uh, you know, pile up and kind of like uh, weigh on your mind and weigh you down. But if you forgive every day, you just, when things happen, when they uh, come along and kind of like forgive as you go, you know, just, uh, you know, live and let live and forgive and do it one day at a time, then it doesn't add up in your mind. Uh, it doesn't bother you because uh, you're letting it go instead. You know, Cindy San, San, mentioned guilt. We haven't even had time to talk about that yet. And we will uh, when we come back. But, you know, it's like uh, the Course says, and this, this is another thing I love about the Course. It'll give you its most advanced ideas right at the beginning, like in those first uh, 50 Miracles Principles, or even in the preface. The Course says that holding no one prisoner to guilt we can be free, and that is so true. You know, the way to be free is to hold no one prisoner to guilt. You know, whether it's uh, you know someone you don't know or Donald Trump or whoever. Yeah, well, we're we're, we're reaching the finish line of our time together here, Cindy and Gary. Do you have any final thoughts about our listeners in Austria, in Switzerland, or in Germany um, that you want? to share um, before you might be coming back sometime, hopefully soon? Um, well, first of all, I, I really do look forward to coming back and I know we will be back. You know, I know we, we will do that and, and it'll be a great reunion when we do. Um, right. You know, use every opportunity that comes up for forgiveness, just grab it and think of it as a blessing because that's what it really is. You know, you can look at challenges that way as a blessing in disguise because it can further awaken you from this dream of separation instead of, instead of further root us in the dream. So just want to encourage people to, to just keep practicing and just think of those challenges and those grievances that you may be having as opportunities because that's what they really are if you use them for that purpose and it can just help you further you along. So, yeah, and uh, I would echo what uh, Cindy is saying. It's like really, you know, turn it up a notch, you know, try uh, even harder. Uh, refuse to compromise on the course. Uh, be determined, you know, you get, as I was saying, you gotta really want the results. Uh, that's the only thing that's gonna make you practice. And uh, if you do it, you'll be glad that you did because uh, it leads to uh, just a better way of life. It's a better quality of life. And it doesn't mean that you have to, uh, you know, forget about having a good time. You can still have a good time too. You know, it's not against the rules. Uh, it's not against the rules to be successful, and be guided by the Holy Spirit to good things. Uh, that's all fine. But our number one job is always forgiveness. And if you remember to do that every day, uh, it's really just going to you. You know, at first, of course, it looks like you're forgiving other people. But every now and then you realize, you know what, I'm the one who's getting the benefits of this forgiveness. I'm the one who feels better. I'm the one who's happier. I'm the one who feels younger. You know, I may not look younger, but I feel younger. You know, so it's like, uh, you know, the good parts of it are really going to you. And, uh, you know, you don't have to think that way, uh, but they are. And the other thing is, uh, if you're with somebody and there's nothing to forgive, the Course says that you should celebrate. You know, if you're the brother and there's nothing to forgive, or a sister, of course, and there's nothing to forgive, then you should celebrate. So you don't have to be forgiving, uh, you know, uh, 24 hours a day, every second of uh, every day. I think the, the course focus is not on forgiving the good things, but on forgiving the negative emotions, which is why it makes such a big deal out of the fact 
that our anger is never justified. It doesn't say that you'll never get angry, but it does say <laughs> that anger is never justified because the secret of salvation is that we're doing this to ourselves. And that, that's why. If this was real, uh, forgiveness would not be justified. But because it's not real, forgiveness is justified. And uh, it's always helpful also to remember that in order to help you to forgive. Thank you. This Thank is you. so inspiring. I, I, yes. I Thank you too for, for taking the time, uh, sharing this, this knowledge, this information, helping all of us to remember and remembering that our way leads us home. Well, we'd love yeah. to talk about the course. So yeah. any, anytime.